Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, th I want to thank KX for organizing all this and uh, letting me speak. And my name is Phineas Porter. I work for Jump Trading. None of the views in this presentation are theirs. They're all my own. So I have to say that. Okay. So today I'm presenting on vector thinking for max profit. Um, this is solving four variations of the best time and to buy and sell lead code questions. So these are sort of like f variations on a theme. They're quite familiar to a lot of people here probably. Um, the goal is to buy and sell. Um, you're given a list of prices, and you're going to buy and sell the st stock. And you want to know what the max profit you can make from by doing this. And we have variation one, which is one transaction. Variation two, which is unlimited transaction. Uh, variation three is two transactions, and then k transactions. So just to remind people of the setup, we're given a list of prices, and we're going to find the max profit. And there's two constraints. The first constraint is you have to buy before you sell. And the second constraint is that you can never hold more than one unit of the security. Um, and so if uh, those familiar in Q for Mortals, Jeff Borer just kind of offhand solves the problem in a QSQL statement. He says, select max px minus mins px from trades where sim is equal to apple. This is the best trade you could have made in apple. And then he says, gives you a hint, says, in case it's not obvious why this solves the problem. Here are two hints. Hint number one, take the perspective looking back from the potential optimum cell, so look from the past. And number two, the buy must have been at the lowest price possible at a local minimum. If not, you could have went back in time and bought a lower price and made more profit. Uh, these two hints are like correspond to the kind of the classics in dynamic programming. One is that you have optimal substructure. So in other words, the problem decomposes into smaller problems that you know how to solve. And two, they're overlapping, so you can reuse those little solutions to make up and solve the big problem. Um, and classically, these two correspond to the two like techniques of dynamic programming, which is recursion and memoization. So recursion, I'm going to recur and make smaller and smaller problems. Memoization, I'm going to somehow memorize these results and then reuse them to make up the big solution. But of course, we can do better. And we're cute programmers, so we can use scan and over iterators to go and solve this bottom up and find the shortest computation, which is always going to be more elegant and more performant. So um, task number one, just to look a little bit more closely at the one transaction version, why this works, um, where p is always going to be prices. We're going to take the minimums, of, the cumulative minimums of p. We're going to subtract the current price p minus the cumulative minimum. We're going to take the max um, and just a little bit of get a little bit an example vector that we're going to be using for the rest of the talk. So this is sort of just like a random example of prices. Um, and look at like little prefixes of the problem to kind of get a sense of what's going on. So if you have just one price, you can't really do much because you have to buy and sell at the same price. So that's going to give you a profit of zero. If the next price is two, you can't do better because you can buy, you have to buy before you sell. So you buy at three and then you sell at two. That's negative one profit. You might as well do nothing. Um, three, two, five. Now you can make profit because you can buy at three and sell at five, or you can buy at two and sell at five. Either way, uh, you prefer to buy at two and then sell at five, so that gives you three. Um, adding one doesn't help you. Um, and then adding three, again, doesn't really help you. you still, your best choice is to buy at two and sell at five. Um, then adding a two doesn't help, doesn't help you. Um, it keeps going, doesn't really help you to buy. But we have now two ways of making three units of profit. One is we can buy at two, sell at five, or we can buy at one and sell at four. Either way, we're making three, but we don't really care one way or another. We're just interested in the max profit overall. So um, the next one is we get a nine. Now suddenly we can do better because we could buy at one and sell at nine. So plainly, that's the, that's the optimum. So from here, we kind of get to, um, if we kind of notice the pattern, we can go and jump to the end. And we see that the best solution for this example is 11, where we can buy at one and sell at 12. To get a sense of what's going on under, under the hood of this to decompose this a little bit, we can see that the first row is the prices. And I'm here, I'm using this PyKX magic to do all the Q. So it's all, this is actually a Python notebook. But um, first row is the prices. The second is the cumulative minimums. So the running minimum as you go down the prices, you can see that it goes three, two, then the best is two, and then it goes one till the end. And then the next is the, the first row minus the second row, which gives us 3 minus 3 is 0, 2 minus 2 is 0, 5 minus 2 is 3. So that gives you that first optimal thing that we all saw. And then later, as you go down, you see the number 11 pop up. So that's like the best price is when you buy it, um, you sell at 12 and buy at 1. And you'll see that in the last row, that just keeps track of the best you've seen so far. So it'll just be 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. Then it'll be suddenly 8. And then it'll be 8 until it hits 11. And it's 11 all the way to the end. 
Um, and we can do, implement this in Python. Um, it's a little bit more verbose because you have to Im import the iterators that you, that you kind of just have available at hand in queue. And you have to implement, import subtraction because you can't just use the minus sign because uh, it's, it's, you know, it's Python. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm going to skip, in the interest of time, skip uh, cases two and three, but the slides are going to be available after the talk, so you can uh, feel free to, I'm sure, and I'm sure KX will post them, so they'll be available. Um, so I'm just going to jump to the last version of the problem, which is, I'm going to say, uh, both the hardest and the most interesting. Okay, so let's tackle the K transactions case. So, um, to quote kind of Eric Domain, like who's like the MIT 606 programming, dynamic programming is recursion plus memoization, so we already know that. So let's set up the problem. We have k transactions, and we're going to have three pieces of state. We're going to have the index that we're currently working at, uh, k, the number of transactions we have left to go, and h, if we're holding or we are we or we're not holding a security. So if we start with the base case, so if we have no transactions left, if k equals zero, well we're going to return zero. We can't do anything. We're not allowed to trade, so we're going to return zero. If i is greater than the last index, well, there's no more prices left, so we're, we're also nothing to do, so we're going to return 0. Otherwise, we only can do one of two things. We can do nothing at the current step, so we're just going to return the function with increment i, or we can do something. But if we can do something, we can do one of two things. If we're holding the security, we have to sell, because we're not allowed to hold more than one unit. So if we sell, we're going to add the current price and the result of calling the function with, I in, with one less transaction and i incremented, or if we don't hold the security, if we're not holding the security, well, we should buy at this step. So we're going to buy, and we're going to subtract the current price. It's just, no, we're going to spend the money to buy at this current price. And we're going to add the result of calling this function with i incremented, and we're left holding a share. So here's the Q version of that exact statement. Um, we're going to have a cache, which is going to be memoizing all of our results. So 0b is the, the, the variable for holding. Are we holding the, current, holding the security? 0 is that we're. Uh, k is zero equal to zero, so we're pre-populating that whenever the transaction number of transactions left is zero, we are going to return zero, and then till count p is the length of the prices. And we can run this for, for zero, for zero, one, two, you know, for all the different values of k, and we'll get different results. Um, but we can also reorganize this a little bit so that we can kind of get a glimmer into how to do the bottom-up approach. And to do that, we have to reorganize a little bit our prices to think about it in the opposite direction. So same exact idea, i, k, but whether or not we've sold. So we just think about it like backwards in time. Uh, and like that's using the insight that Jeff Bohr kind of gave about like thinking about it from the perspective of having already sold it. So again, if k equals 0, we're going to return 0. But if i, is, if i is 0 this time, in other words, we're working backwards into the array to the original one, then if we've already sold the share, we have to buy it back and return negative the first price. Otherwise, we can just return 0. So that's all it's saying is that if you've already sold it and you're still holding the share, you've got to sell it before you leave the problem. You can't just get away with selling and never having bought it. You have to cover your short effectively. Um, so, and the same thing, uh, the rest of this slide is the same. So we're, if we have the solution to the max of two options, we can either do nothing, which is just the same function but decrementing i. So again, we're just working backwards through the array. Or do something. If we sold a share, we have to buy it. Or otherwise, if we haven't sold a share, um, then we would want to sell right now. So here's that code, same, same thing. Um, and again, we get the same answer. But what's more interesting is, can we kind of zoom in and see if we can do better? So let's look at the intermediate results of the cache. And this is, I think, the most interesting piece. If you look, the first row is the prices, but the, 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 the rows represent the k transactions. And what you can see is, so for the zero case, that's sort of the trivial case. You can do no transactions. You're always going to return zero. You can't do any better. The first row is going to correspond to the first problem we saw, which is one transaction. You can see the same the th pattern of three eights and then an 11. But the second row is two transactions. You can see that in the first case, in the, fir the, the first time you see a three, it's the same as the previous row. Then it's going to be three, three, and then it's going to be five. Well, you, we can see what's going on. Two, you, what you can do is you can first make profit by going and selling to five. And then you can also make, uh, sorry, you can make one unit of profit by selling from two to five, which gives you three units. But then you can also make a profit by selling from buying at one and selling at three. So that gives you two more units. So that total, your total best so far is five. So you can kind of see what's going on is like we're building this matrix from uh, top, top left to bottom right. So like it's filling in this way. So if we actually take this insight, in other words, we're taking the current so far and then subtracting the price, we can tra translate this into 
the following, which is that you take the max, the maxes of P plus the maxes of the current amount of profit you've already made minus the prices. So you can just think of it, the C variable as that like, current state variable that's, t that's telling you how much you've already, you already had um, of profit so far, and then subtract P and do one more transaction. So if we do it that way, uh, the, all of that code before that was like six lines of, of recursion becomes just this one line. But if we look a little bit closer at this function, kind of zoom into it, we can notice something interesting, which is that max is C minus P is just the same as P minus C. And to prove this to yourself, just think about the fact that when you multiply by negative 1, uh, greater than becomes less than. And mins and, and maxes are actually just the equivalent. So you can, if you just swip that around, you can see that mins, it becomes the original min, mins P, which should be familiar, because the first problem we ever did was max is P minus mins P. So all we've done now is just said subtract C. And in the general case, the first, the first transaction case, C is always 0. So P, minus, so P minus 0 is the same as just P. So that's why you can leave that out. But if we want to keep that current state variable so we can iterate and do K transactions, so every additional, we can just say mins P minus. And just leave that, omit the, fair, project, omit the last variable, and then that will be a function. And then we can write this, the kth solution as this really elegant thing. So we have the price as p, lowercase p. But then we have capital P, which is just max is p minus mins p minus. And that's just going to wait for the how much reward have you gone so far. So the, first, the one transaction case is easy. You just do p of 0. The, second, the two transaction cases just call p twice on 0. And then the k transaction case is p of take, do k transactions, so just run k. Uh, K, K, run p k times, and if you want to do the unlimited case, just converge until over zero. Um, so that gives you all these all the solutions uh, with one thing. And if we want to be really cheeky, we can say we can solve the whole thing in five characters and just do p scan zero, which gives you all the intermediate results as well. So that's the first case is you earn zero profit, then you earn one, then then the two transaction case and up and it, up, and it converges at five for this example. But in general, it can converge after and some k over two transactions, or n over 2, like the number of prices. You, could, you need pairs of prices to sell, so there can never be more than k, or like n over 2. But um, that's the end of my talk. Any questions?